welcome Psych, one, Psych 201 students to our first video lecture where we, we, we will start to explore chapter one, issues and themes in child development. There are four, four major sections of this chapter uh, represented by these learning questions. There will be a separate video for each of these learning sections learning sections or questions. So this video will deal with who needs to have a good understanding of child development and why. And then later we will get into the domains and issues and themes in the, in the second video, the context for child development in the third video, and being a smart consumer of information in the fourth and final video of chapter one. So let's begin with why do we study child development? We want to study child development in order to understand the basic process of development. The, you know, how the traits and behaviors and experiences that we have in childhood, how they shape us as we grow into adolescence and eventually adults. Because it's, it's, it's certainly all connected. I mean, what happens to us in, in early in life, in the, you know, particularly in, in the first three to five years, really kind of sets us up for how we will experience life um, later as an adolescent and, and then later as an adult. It's not like we start over, you know, every year of, of life and then we have a fresh beginning. I mean, what happens early on in childhood affects us throughout the rest of our lives. Um, we're, I'm going to put up a short video that kind of talks about this theme. It's not the most exciting video, but, but it has some very important points. So let's take a look at that now. Just give me a moment as I get to it. Okay. Um, okay here we go. So this is called the science of early childhood development and you and you'll see that they the speaker makes connections between you know very the very early years in life and how it's going to affect us later the healthy development of young children in the early years of life literally does provide a foundation for just about um, all of the challenging social problems that that our society and other societies face. What we're learning, um, not just from behavioral and developmental research, but also now from exciting developments in neuroscience and molecular biology, is how much early experience um, from birth, in fact, even before birth, how much this experience literally gets into our bodies and, and shapes our uh, learning capacities, our behaviors, and our physical and mental health. The brain is basically built from the bottom up. First, the ba brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills. And So just looking at this graph here, look how much development is taking place just within the first year of life. I mean, it's really highlighting, you know, how much circuitry is going on in the, in the, in the brain um, during, during the very first year of life. And, and, and so this is what he meant by, you know, you're really laying the foundation of, of your brain very early on after birth. And in, in fact, it starts even before birth, but um, that first year is, is critical for shaping the, you know, what your, your brain will eventually be. And then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills. Biologically, the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting um, the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry. It's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in the reciprocal relationship, relationships that children have with the adults in their lives. And by that we mean um, what we refer to as the serve and return nature of children's interaction with their own adults. Development and the impact of experience on development 
is not a one-way street. It's a back and forth interaction. The brain is a highly integrated organ, which has multiple sections that specialize in different um, uh, kind of processes. So we have parts of the brain that are involved more in cognitive function and other parts that are involved in processing of emotion and parts involved in seeing and hearing. So if a child is emotionally uh, kind of well put together and socially competent, that will affect more positive and productive learning. And if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress, no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be, his or her learning is going to be impaired by that kind of emotional interference. So when we talk about healthy development in the early years, and particularly when we talk about preparing children to succeed in school, we cannot separate cognitive development from social and emotional development. Um, you can't have one without the other. All development builds on what comes before. So when children experience stable, nurturing relationships, it fosters the development of healthy circuitry. And when children experience uncertainty or instability or abusive or neglectful relationships, it literally disrupts the circuitry and the brain's architecture as it's being built. Um, over time, uh, this has a wear and tear effect. And the more stress you have, the more causes of stress, and the longer your stress response, the more likely you are to have a whole range of problems uh, later on. It can affect the immune system. So here we see just the how much, uh, how much uh, the risk factors early in life is going to affect you later. I mean, having more risk factors in the first three years of life makes it much more likely that you'll have developmental delays. Um, so even though in the first few years of life you 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 haven't started any schooling or anything like that, but but the the risk factors as as they multiply and you have more and more of them, it's going to cause delays throughout throughout your childhood and 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 beyond. And and this will affect your your schooling. Uh, let's go on. System, it can affect the cardiovascular system. And this is why excessive prolonged stress early in life is associated with a higher prevalence later, not only of learning problems and behavior difficulties, but also physical and mental health problems. Because the brain is optimally flexible and plastic early in life, but as it develops its circuitry and refines its circuitry, it loses some of its flexibility, which is why intervening early is so important because as we often say, when it comes to brain circuitry, it's better to get it right the first time than to try to fix it later. Okay. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Give me one second here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so that video was really pointing out that, that you know, it's we build upon the early years as, as the foundation and and problems that we experience later in childhood or adolescence or even adulthood, sometimes the roots are back in those first three to five years of, of life where perhaps the architecture of the brain wasn't properly formed because of adverse conditions, living in, growing up in poverty, um, growing up with abuse or um, in chaotic environments and things like that. Uh, one example of you know a connection of connecting um, childhood traits with with later adult um, development uh, comes from Terman's 1921 study of gifted children. This was a longitudinal study. We're going to get to talking about longitudinal studies more in um, chapter three, but longitudinal study means that you you follow a group of subjects, you know, throughout many years. In this case, it was really a lifetime study where they, he uh, selected um, gifted children, um, you know, early in childhood and, and he followed this group of children all the way until, until their deaths, really. Um, obviously, it's not a, the kind of study that's just done 
by one person, but it's, it's done over time by a group of researchers. But uh, what what he found in the study was that um, that children who were rated high in, in conscientiousness back back in at the time of publication, this was called social dependability. We now we now call it conscientiousness. And it, it's it's one of our main major personality traits. And those that those children that were high in conscientiousness, it turns out that they had many positive outcomes in adulthood. And so these children were rated, you know, fairly early in childhood and and they ended up having better outcomes in adulthood, including a 30% reduction in the likelihood that they would die in any particular year. They were 30% less likely to die compared to the children that were rated as, as less conscientious. Um, and, and this just shows that there's a link between, you know, our traits and our experiences early in life and the, and outcomes, you know, all the way into older age when we're in, and when we when we actually end up dying. Um, and if you think about it, it, it should make some sense. Um, conscientious individuals, it turns out, are, are less li- much less likely to smoke and drink to excess. And so obviously this may, is going to prolong their lives, make it less likely that they'll die in any given year. Conscientious, conscientious individuals usually also tend to exercise more and, and eat better as well. But but um, they found that that they could rate, you know, all the way back in childhood, they could give, rate the children. And then it showed that, you know, there was a continuity. Those that were rated high in, in conscientiousness as children would tended to be more conscien- conscientious, excuse me, as adults as well and continue, you know, better health habits and things like that. So, we, you know, this was one an early study that just showed that that the traits and the experiences we have early in childhood affect us lifelong in a, in a lifelong way. Um, okay, now I've been talking a lot about early experiences, but certainly later experiences are important too. I mean, your your life isn't completely set after you know after the first five years of life, but the later experiences that we have as individuals will have, will have less impact on us if the proper foundation is not first laid down. And by proper foundation, I mean you know, the basic form of the brain. Um, we saw in that earlier video, you know, how much development was going on in that first year of life in the brain. And so when we think about a, a proper foundation, we need an adequate starting point in order for later experiences to affect us in, in positive ways. And I like this, you know, this um, second point here, early experiences are like the foundation of a house and later experiences are everything that gets added on like the walls and the roof and the electric connections and et cetera. You know, the things that you see, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, the things that you normally associate with the house. But if that foundation is not a solid foundation, over time, those walls and the roof, they're going to crack and, and eventually crumble because uh, the, uh, without a solid foundation, the, the house will shift. And, and so you, all that nice stuff that we, that makes up a house and that we add to it and make it look nice. I mean, it, it all is really dependent upon having a solid foundation, which is, which is analogous to, to the early brain development. I'm going to show you another video, and it's just kind of following up on that first video and talking about some of the, some of the similar themes about the importance of the early foundation of, of brain development. So let's go there now. We know from research on the biology of stress that that negative impact of that during sensitive periods of time that's going to sculpt the architecture of the brain can have effects on learning behavior and physical and mental health. What this is allowing us to say is that these experiences that children uh, come, come across that we provide them with 
in those first three or four or five years provides the scaffolding. Doesn't guarantee a perfect life later on, but it, in a sense, is an insurance policy. Some experiences are more important early in life than later in life, and therefore it argues for investing in what happens in those first three to five years. So persistent stress changes brain architecture. Let me show you this. Um, we know that there are changes in the structure of the, of, the, of the nerve cell that's responsible for communication, for the ability of children to respond in, in their world. This is a typical neuron sitting in the, in the prefrontal cortex, which this is a neuron that uh, uh, after it, uh, it uh, un undergoes chronic stress during development, this is the way it ends up. So toxic stress results in, in architectural changes of Okay, so talk, he's saying toxic stress affects the architecture. And, and I mean, what a, what a difference here, just looking at the, these two pictures of how much less, there, less development there is in a neuron that's damaged by toxic stress. So often people don't really think about how the brain is changing when a child has undergoing adverse conditions. They think, well, you know, somehow it affects their, their personality, perhaps, or, or their traits, or but. But I mean, it's happening at a, in the brain architecture. And, and this, this is not something we just rebound from. It's like, oh, I'll catch, this child will catch up later and, and grow more connections. I mean, this is permanent damage that can be done to a brain early in life. So a child with a, with a lot of toxic stress early in life, their brain will never develop as to, its, to the potential that it was you know, biologically capable of. That this, this is a form of brain damage, even if, you know, that even if it's not, doesn't show up necessarily right away or as, as being, you know, as, as being recognizable as, as, as brain damage, but it, what it is a form of brain damage when a child faces adverse conditions early in life while the brain is, is at its maximum, you know, development. Uh, and, and once again, it, this is a permanent kind of condition. So, we can harm children right from the beginning of life, even if their conditions improve, the later, if the foundation's not there once again, it doesn't matter how nice their life becomes later. Maybe they, they get better, move to better parents, or maybe their, their family situation improves and, and they get a lot of money or something. But I mean, once the damage is done, this child will never quite be who they could have been because of this early damage. Okay fewer connections. It's not only are they at risk for drug and alcohol dependence, um, but other aspects of their biology. They're at risk for depression. Maybe nobody's surprised by that. They're at risk for cardiovascular disease earlier. It's not as though the die is cast and you know the door slams shut, but it will say to us, if you want to get this kid back on a typical developmental trajectory, if you wait too late, it's going to be like pushing open a thousand pound door instead of just having it swing open very gently, which you can do with the right early experiences. The second is as we understand how experience affects the brain, we're in a better position to do two things. To identify as early in life as possible kids who are at risk for falling off a typical developmental trajectory. And the second is to develop interventions that target specific circuits in the brain. There's a critical period. There's a period of time during which this profound neglect that they've experienced, right, uh, requires an intervention and enrichment, um, and it has to happen within a certain period of time in order to, for it to have its most powerful effects. The most important ingredient in positive experiences for young children is the responsive adult or set of adults that are there in the child's life who are helping to let that brain be excited about learning and supporting that brain's development. In addition to uh, trying to focus on getting to the most at-risk populations as soon as possible, and that would be before birth, if I had to just focus on dealing with the situations after birth where you have an infant or you have a toddler, um, that developing uh, daycare systems where we um, rank them in terms of their quality where we uh, provide the resources to encourage them to hire the very best staff. You can't do it on the cheap. 
that if we start with those systems and and generate a, a, a systems of excellence early and apply those to the most at-risk uh, individuals, that's where we're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. And that if we then continue to be mindful of how experience writes on the brain, then we're much more likely to have children who wind up being successful, happy, productive citizens of society. Okay, so let me take you back to our PowerPoint. So I wanted to start out with a couple of videos like that, just to, you know, right away point out that that you know, our development is connected from, from early childhood to later childhood to adolescence to adulthood. And and what happens to us early on is it affects us throughout the rest of our lives. Um, now this this particular slide so that later experiences are important too. And I've been really kind of focused on the early experiences of the brain architecture. And both of these videos talked about, you know, early early years, the early years of brain development and the importance. I mean, certainly there's the things that happen later still matter and they're still important. I'll just provide one example here. And this is a it was a study by Alan Srufe. I don't know. It's it's spelled S-R-O-U-F-E. I don't know how to pronounce it, it's Srufe or something, but Alan Srufe. But anyways, he um he just um, did some research that that followed up on on some. There was some earlier. Let me start on, over. There was some earlier early research that showed that early secure attachment, that first attachment you form, typically with your mother, um, that it predict it predicts later romantic relations. Um, young infants and toddlers that develop a secure attachment with their caregiver tend to have better relationships later in life. Because it's kind of like that first relationship and that first attachment is kind of a model that goes into that early brain architecture that, that provides you with an example of this is a loving relationship. You know, if you have a, a caring and, and responsive adult, uh, uh, typically, once again, the mother is usually the first attachment. If, if she's, you know, provides a loving relationship for you, you kind of, it, it kind of gets built into your brain. This is what it feels like to be cared for by another. And this is like what a healthy relationship feels like. And even though we don't consciously remember those, you know, first couple of years of life, I mean, it, it is built into your brain. And this is why we tend to have better relationships as adults. But what Sufe did, just to go back to Alan, Alan Sufe, he, he showed in research that, you know, your later childhood relationships your friendships that you develop later in childhood and early in adolescence, that these also affect your later romantic relationships. So it's not just the early experiences, but the, he showed that these were very important as well. Um, because once again, those, those are related to romantic relationships later too. If you have a very strong friendship, there's more intimacy and things like that, you, that you're still learning in later childhood and in early, early adolescence. It's not all dependent on early secure attachment is what he showed, uh, that they're both important for, for having successful relationships later in life. Okay, let me go on here. So let's look at another reason um, for studying child development is, is you know, we, we, the first was that we wanted to understand the process of development. And the second is that we want to use that knowledge we don't want to just understand how children develop. We want to use it um, in order to help improve the lives of children and adolescents and to foster positive development. Well, who's going to use that knowledge? Well, certainly parents and families can use information, child development information, to, to understand and interact with their children. Um, just to, once again, give you one example in particular is, I mean, research shows that, that teen parents in particular um, are really able to benefit from, from intervention programs that provide information on, on child development. Because the teen mothers, or, or not mothers, but teen mothers or fathers 
are, are less likely to know what to expect of, of having children and, and raising children than, than our older parents. So research shows when they're provided with child development information and, and you know, um, taught about how, ch how children develop and how early, for instance, how early experiences affect later development, um, they really benefit and do a better job raising their children. So, I mean, knowledge can help parents, particularly younger parents, um, know what to expect from their from their infants and toddlers and early ch early childhood age children. Um, obviously, as well, child development professionals certainly use child development knowledge. You know, a number of examples are listed here: teachers, psychologists, speech and language therapists, social workers early intervention specialists, you could add nurses, and, you know, uh, and really, I mean, daycare workers and child care workers, I mean, anyone that is, that's working with children, I mean, will benefit, obviously, from child development knowledge. Um, if you're interested in any of these different careers, remember, you can go to the Occupational Outlook Handbook. Um, I've made it. I've made that. Uh, um, I've made that into our first discussion board, where I, you know, I require you to go there and look up a career because I want you to become familiar with it. It's a great resource for learning about different careers and, and different types of uh, specialties. Um, and so, make sure you do check out the Occupational Outlook Handbook, and and um, you'll need to do that for your for your first discussion board. Um, and you know the instructions on how to reach that that web page are are in the first discussion board, but they're also in your textbook in the first chapter. Um, um, okay, let's go on here. Um, another set of individuals that can certainly use child development information are are policymakers, and. Um, this is you know, kind of a, the less obvious group of people. And when, when I asked about who can use child development information, students always come up with, you know, different professionals like teachers and nurses and, and, and they always come up with parents, but most people forget, you know, about policymakers and, and the policymakers are the ones that make the laws, you know, for, for our country or for our state. And, and it affects things like, our daycare system or childcare system and, and things like um, parental leave policies, which in case you don't know, tend to be pretty horrible in the US compared to most other countries. We will talk more about that in another chapter, but we really don't do a good job of helping parents stay at home to raise their children when they're young. Um, uh, WIC programs, WIC stands for stands for women, infants, and children. Um, and this is a program, very good program for, for pre either for pregnant women or those that have children up to the age of five. So it's concentrating once again on very early, the very early years. And um, it provides supplemental food for, for those uh, women that are in need. Um, I, you know, first of all, before, before giving birth while they're pregnant, um, if they receive the right, you know, proper nutrition, it makes it less likely that they will have a premature birth and it less likely that they will have a low birth weight baby because nutrition is incredibly important during, during pregnancy. Um, but many, many mothers that, that are of lower socioeconomic standing, you know, don't always have the right nutrition while they're pregnant. And then it helps feed their their young infants and, and young children up to once again up to the age of five with supplemental food. Also, they provide nutrition, uh, nutrition education for these these mothers, uh, including like very very strongly promoting breastfeeding. There are so many benefits to breastfeeding a child. Um, and once again, this is something else we'll look at in more closely in another chapter, but um, the WIC program really does a good job of, of kind of promoting and, and pushing the idea that you should breastfeed 
your your child, um, you know, to, to start their life off right. Um, another social policy we could add here would be healthcare. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I probably probably shouldn't get too far into this. I mean, I have some strong opinions about it, but I don't. You know, I don't believe we have a very comprehensive. Um, healthcare system to, to benefit everyone in the U.S. Um, we have a system in the U.S. that really benefits those with money more than those without, certainly. Um, and having, you know, grown up and lived in, in Canada for most of my life, uh, I would I would certainly take the Canadian system over, over the U.S. at many times. Um, it, it, a lot of it depends on your fundamental belief of, about whether or not basic health care should depend on the amount of money that you have. And, and you know, is in the US system, we're, we're basically saying that people that have more money, that their health and, and their lives are worth more than, than those that have less money. And other countries that make it, that try to equalize it, like Canada for where everyone can get, you know, can get um, treated with any kind of procedure, you know, no matter how much money they have. I mean, it, it kind of equalizes and says that every life is equally important. And, and this is kind of the basic philosophy philosophy between um, the US system versus most of the rest of the world's um, system, healthcare systems. Um, and that is that ours is very much money, you know, uh, monetarily based. And, um, you, you know, we hear stories all the time, but there are people that just can't get procedures because they can't afford them. And, and this includes with young children and things like that. So I just something to think about, but this is the kind of thing that, that we try to use um, child development knowledge for. And, and, and so we know if, if young children, if their illnesses aren't treated early in life and they're not given optimal health care, we know it affects their brains. And then we shouldn't be surprised later in life if, if they're not, you know, Good productive citizens. And, um, I mean, we if we if we're not willing to give everyone an, an equal start uh, early in life, and and at the very least, I, I think we could, we should make a system where at the very least that that, that children are 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 given all the health care that they need, even if if you want to make a distinction later in life and that rich adults deserve to live longer or something like that. Well, that's one thing, but I don't think. A child that's born to a poor into a poor household um, should be penalized because their parents don't have money. Anyways, let's go on here. So, um, all the research that we do on child development and what we what we show can should be used by these policymakers to come up with policies that that make sense, such as promoting breastfeeding, because. We know from research how important it is. So, um, anyways, that concludes the first section of chapter one on who needs to have a good understanding of child development and why.